Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, we're gonna be looking at a VIC-2 replacement for the Commodore 64 that is modern, offers new features, and of course, has HDMI output. So without further ado, let's get right to it. This is my Ziff 64, which I've shown on the channel a lot of times. It's the one I use for all my testing. It's been through a lot, this machine. I originally got it, it wasn't working. I fixed it. I've replaced uh, many of the sockets with Ziffs or zero insertion force sockets. There are some interesting things in here, like the RF modulator has been removed. The PLA, I've tested many different PLAs in here. Right now there's a Russian PLA chip which I'll make a video about at some point in the future. But yeah, this is a replacement PLA made with a Russian chip. I have some replacement ROM chips in here. And just generally, this is my good old trusty test bed. When it comes to the custom ICs that Commodore used in the 64, there are several that are bespoke and were only used in this machine or maybe a few Commodore machines. And luckily in this day and age, we have modern replacements for a good number of them. The PLA, which has got to be one of the most common failures in this machine, there are lots of alternatives now, like the GAL PLA and other CPLD-based ones, which I've shown already on the channel. This SID chip is another chip that fails quite a bit, but luckily there are some modern replacements for this as well. They may not be perfect, but ones like the FPGA SID and the ARM SID, and of course the old SWIN SID, which I have one of, is a decent replacement for this chip. This is the CPU, which is a 6510. It's a derivative of the 6502. It has some changes to it specifically for the Commodore 64, and it means that you can't just pop a regular 6502 in here and use the machine. Luckily, there are some projects already that allow you to use a 6502 with some extra logic chips to support that extra functionality, and I think there is an FPGA version of the 6502 or 6510 that's being worked on that will also allow a replacement of this without any issues. These two chips here are MOS 6526s. These are IO chips. They're used for all the input and output on the 64, including the keyboard, joystick ports, the disc ports, stuff like that. If these fail, you have those things stop working. Unfortunately, these chips were really only used on 64s. So if they do fail, you'll have to take it out of another 64. And, and that means potentially ruining another machine. There is one other possible source for these and it's Commodore Amiga. Some of the Amigas use these chips as well. They were a different part number 8000 series, but they're pin compatible. They do work in the 64 without any issue. And the only problem with them is the way they keep track of the clock. These have clock capabilities where you know you can set hours and minutes and seconds and it will keep the time. And the way the Amiga chips do it is different. So that functionality won't work on the 64, but I've actually tested those in here and it doesn't seem to really affect anything. I'm not quite sure which programs use that real-time clock functionality that are in these chips. The last custom chip that is really kind of considered the heart of the Commodore 64 is this one right here. It's underneath an MSI heatsink, but it's a ceramic package. And this of course is the VIC-2 chip, which is the graphics chip for the Commodore 64. It generates all the graphics you see on screen. It also handles the clock generation for the machine as well. It uses a crystal oscillator here to generate then say the CPU clock. Without this chip in here, the 64 cannot work at all because it's absolutely necessary to generate at the minimum the CPU clocks. But then of course, without this in here, you're also gonna have no video display of any kind. So what kind of computer do you have if you have no graphics, right? Until recently, I was not aware of any modern replacements for the VIC-2 chip. So if this chip failed on your 64, you were gonna be dead in the water and you had to source another one to put into your machine. And unfortunately, because these are becoming more and more scarce, and as the value of 64s goes up, they are getting harder and harder to find for a reasonable price. Often you might be spending 30, 40, 50 dollars to find a used chip to put into your machine, and you're gonna hope that that chip even works, and if it does, you're just gonna be getting back to the same functionality that you had before, which I'm not saying it's bad, but you're gonna be getting composite and S-video output through the RF modulator, you know, the usual stuff that we're all used to. Well, several weeks ago, I opened up my YouTube app and had a recommendation for what looked like a modern replacement for the VIC-2 chip on a Commodore 64. I was intrigued, I watched the videos with interest, and I commented on them. 
So Randy, the creator of that project, reached out to me and asked me if I wanted to do some testing for him. And of course, I jumped at that opportunity because that sounds so cool. I'm really intrigued at how well his project works. So fast forward a little bit of time, and here is the replacement FPGA. Now this, of course, is a prototype. So the size of this thing is completely not respective of any final products. This is still very early stages. But what you're looking at here is a Spartan FPGA on this top board is plugged in, it's a dev board. And the bottom board is the one that Randy has designed. And this right here is what connects into the motherboard where the VIC-2 goes. And on the side here, you have pin headers that do the video output. Currently, this adapter that's plugged in is an HDMI output that's made possible by this HDMI transmitter chip right here. The signals output from this stack of boards here are really just the constituent RGB signals and a horizontal and vertical sync. And that's all this HDMI transmitter needs to generate a working HDMI signal. Let me stop talking about this and let's just check it out in operation. So out with the VIC-2 chip, in with this board. Of course, the ZIF socket makes it extra easy, but there we go, it's in there. Now, of course, this prototype's quite large, so it means that it's not gonna really fit inside the case. In fact, when I take an HDMI cable here and I connect it up to the uh, little board here, uh, it's uh, sticking out the side of the case, which prevents me from putting the lid on. You may notice the HDMI adapter is at an angle. Randy thought of that on purpose that way, and that's because on his 64, he has the RF shield around the VIC-2 chip, and for clearance issues around these components over here, he had to do this. On mine here, because I have the ZIF socket, which already raises it up, it's not really a concern. I'm just gonna take this and put this right here as a little bit of strain relief for the HDMI cable so it's not pushing down on the entire thing. This board is only held in right now by my ZIF socket over here. So I didn't wanna to put too much leverage on this here. It would just pull it right out. And I'll just plug in my keyboard here and I'll have to lay this off to the side uh, just so I can do some typing on here. So I'll hook it on. Let's see, I'll get it just like this. Oops, that fell out, there we go. Before I turn it on, there's one more thing to connect and it's this wire here. This goes from the FPGA board to the reset line on the 64. He provided me this easy hook here. So I'm just gonna hook this on there, which is the reset line. The reason for the reset line connection is because the FPGA board takes a little bit of time to boot up and therefore you might get a black screen when you turn on your 64. So with this, this can reset the 64 once this is fully ready and you're gonna ensure that it's gonna operate every time you turn it on. And we're ready to test. Let's turn this on. Hopefully this works. Okay, my monitor is very slow to come up. There it is, look at that. I've locked the focus on the camera, so hopefully you get an idea of how sharp it is. Unfortunately, my monitor is displaying this in widescreen, which obviously is not the correct aspect ratio for the 64. But if I type a few characters here, you may notice the incredible, well, pixel perfect sharpness that we're getting right here. The video display on my LCD monitor, it looks just like we were looking at uh, an emulator, like Vice on a computer. It's perfectly square pixels, it's so sharp, everything. Which you may or may not like because some people prefer that analog look. But the truth of the matter is, if you have a 64 with a dead VIC-2 chip, you can pop this thing in here and you have a working machine now. All the other components inside the 64 are original and nothing else is being emulated only the VIC-2 chip is being emulated on the FPGA. So I'm gonna power off the computer and I'm gonna stick in my Easy Flash 3 cartridge and I'm gonna connect my SDIEC so we can load some software on here. All right, powering it back on, we are straight into the Easy Flash 3 menu and it is looking sharper than I have ever seen any 64 look on the output. Even all that work I did with the RF modulator replacement, trying to sharpen the video, and I'll put a link to those videos if you haven't seen them, don't get close to the sharpness of this monitor right now, what it's displaying in HDMI. Now, in case anyone's interested, the actual native HDMI resolution that's being output right now is 834 by 502 at 30 kilohertz and 58 hertz refresh rate. That does seem slightly slower than the NTSC original VIC-2 chip, which I think outputs at 60 hertz. So I'll need to ask Randy about this to see if it's really outputting at 58 frames per second, or this is just my monitor reporting it like this. Randy has provided me a disc here with some utilities and some test programs to play around with. So let's start with the config program here. This pops up with the VIC-2 Kawari config utility. Kawari is the code name for this project that the creator Randy has come up with. 
So right off the bat, you may notice here it says chip model 6567R8 NTSC. So one of the really cool things about this project, in my opinion, is that the FPGA on here is ignoring and it's not even connected to the crystal oscillator that is on the Commodore 64. This is generating all the clock signals internally for the machine, which means you can switch between NTSC and PAL on the fly. Well, almost on the fly. On the config utility here is if I hit C for change chip model, it will change to a 6569 PAL and there is also a 6567R56A, which is the first NTSC version of the VIC-2 chip, which has slightly different luminance values for some of the colors. But if we pick the PAL one and we hit S for save, it has saved, but you notice nothing has changed. But if I power cycle the machine now, it will restart the machine in PAL mode. And there it is. Notice the border on the top and the bottom is now bigger. The screen looks a little more squished. Of course, the aspect ratio is still wrong and that has to do with my monitor, but this is now running in PAL. Let's bring up the information screen on the monitor. We should be able to see the change in refresh rate. And there we go. The resolution is now 808 by 569, 31 kilohertz and 50 hertz. So it's odd that the actual PAL mode seems to run at the correct 50 hertz, but the NTSC mode seems to be running at 58 hertz. That is slightly unexpected. I can assure you that the machine itself is running in PAL mode. So if I load 8-Bit Dance Party here with the Donkey Kong arcade intro song, you'll hear that it's playing at the normal PAL speed versus the faster NTSC speed that we normally hear when, when I show the demo on my channel. Well, I'm not used to the speed of that song being slow. And I know this is the correct speed for this song. It was composed in PAL frequencies. So I'm gonna jump out of here. We're gonna go back to the config utility and let's check out what it sounds like in NTSC mode. There we go, 6567R8. So I'll hit save. We'll quit out of there, power cycle the machine. Let's see how this sounds now. All right, so that sounds exactly like I'm used to in NTSC mode. So when replacing the VIC-2 chip with something modern like this, obviously the feature of being able to switch between PAL and NTSC is an awesome one. But Randy decided to go even further and add some more functionality to this that's not in the normal VIC-2 chip. On his disk, he has a program here called Palette Test. Now there's the regular Commodore 64 palette. And actually one thing that's interesting is the original palette Randy was using was more like the original Pepto palette from the PAL machines. It was very, shall we say, muted colors. I'm used to the way NTSC Commodore 64s look and the colors on NTSC are just more vibrant. They come across much more vibrant. So I asked him to actually send me some new firmware for the VIC-2 replacement that has more vibrant colors. And I picked one of the palettes out of Vice and he actually extracted those colors and added them right into the firmware of this thing. So the colors you're seeing here and the colors on the splash screen or the easy flash are what I am used to. The fact that Randy was able to change the palettes for me is sort of an indicator that there is actually a cool feature that he added and it's software control of the color palettes from the Commodore 64 itself. So as I said, this is the stock 16 colors on the 64. If I hit the space bar, huh, look at that. All red, new 64 color palette. There is a green version. We have 16 shades of blue. And here's from a purple to green and everything in between. And there is a monochromatic grayscale one. Now stopping on this palette from the purple to green, if I reset out of here and back into the easy flash, the entire Commodore 64 palette is changed now. And that's really because right now this does not listen to the reset signal on the 64. So the only way for me to reset the palette back to the original one is to either do it through basic with poke commands or to just power cycle the machine. Randy is already talking about a functionality where he's gonna to listen to the reset line. So if I push the reset button on the Easy Flash 3, it would actually reload the stock palette so you don't get this interesting effect. But it's kind of cool. It just shows that the colors are all redefinable on the fly 
So if you're using one of these on your 64 and you're writing some software for it, you can customize the palettes yourself for the program you're doing on demand. I relaunched the palette test program and if I hit Q to exit out of it, it's actually gonna reset the colors back to the original more Pepto color scheme that Randy had picked. And there they are. This is more like the PAL colors, I guess, that the people in Europe are used to. If I reset and go back to Easy Flash 3, there's the screen. And yeah, it just, it looks so muted to me. This is not how Commodore 64s look when they're hooked up to NTSC displays or even their RetroTINK. In addition to customizable palettes, Randy added some new image display modes. I won't talk too much about these because these may not even stay in the final product. But right now, if we run image horse here, for instance, a grayscale picture of a horse shows up, and this is actually running in a custom resolution that is 640 by 200, and it's not even using the memory of the Commodore 64 to display this image. When you load the program, it actually pushes it into the frame buffer in the VIC-2 chip itself, so you could have multiple images like this, and it's not even consuming any of the RAM in the 64. These programs that display the images are just machine language programs, so therefore it's uh, Sys2063 to run it, but you'll notice if I run it again, it will display the horse instantly because it's gonna switch over to the frame buffer of that high resolution image and that picture is still sitting in there loaded. So even though it's gonna reload the picture, it will show this instantly. So hit when I hit enter, it should show up immediately. And there it is. And then it just had to switch the color palette. He has some other pictures as well. There's, here's one of a field. It's still displaying 16 colors, but of course it's using the customizable color palette to show colors that wouldn't normally be possible on a 64. And finally, we have a picture of Grogu, and that's from the Disney Plus show Mandalorian. And there he is, Grogu, with a very green color palette that matches his skin tone. Definitely something, again, that would never be possible on the Commodore 64. This is much more akin to an image displayed on an Apple II GS or an Atari ST than a Commodore 64. As I had just mentioned, though, Randy probably is going to be taking those graphics modes out of the finished product. And that's because he said they're very difficult to program and he doesn't think anyone's going to use them anyways. So he's probably not going to leave those in there, at least those uh, high resolution graphics modes specifically. That is not to say Randy did not add one other cool piece of functionality to this FPGA board. And after loading this wedge, if I do Sys51200, there we have it native 80 columns display mode on a Commodore 64. Please ignore the skinny font you've been seeing on my 64. That has nothing to do with Randy's project. That has all to do with the character generator ROM chip I have in here. I replaced the ROM chip with one with a skinny font from the VIC-20 because I wanted to see how the VIC-20 font looked on the 64 in 40 columns or even 80 columns mode here. But with the original character generator back in for the 64, it would have the double pixel wide font as everyone is used to. And yes, Randy's 80 column mode also uses the original character font. So we have a copy of the old basic game adventure on the disc here. And sure enough, if I run this, there it is. This game is running in 80 columns mode. So basic totally supports uh, 80 columns. If I do a list, now it's a little slow the way the scrolling works and that's because the 80 column wedge is having to move all the characters around. Apparently there is no hardware scrolling routine in this mode. So it's very much slower than it would be in 40 column. But if I go up to a line here, like line 850, it definitely, the editor fully supports the extra columns. So if I put Rem Adrian at the end here and we hit enter. Now if we go back down here and I type list 850, and there it is, Rem Adrian is added to the line. The editor, the basic editor fully supports the 80 column mode. As I had mentioned with the graphics mode, the 80 column mode is also separate from the 40 column mode when it comes to text and the way the memory is displayed. So, so if I typed in sys51203, it jumped right back into 40 columns mode here. And let me sys51200. Okay, well it was there and then it cleared it. Notice typing on one of them or the other doesn't affect each other. That's because, like I said, the memory buffers are completely separate. There it is, back to 40 columns, and you're able to switch back and forth really easily. Randy has already modified a copy of Novaterm, the terminal emulator for the 64, to support his 80 column mode, and it does work. So already there's one program to support this 80 column mode, which is super cool. Back in the config utility, there's one other thing here that you may have noticed earlier when I ran it. Press R for raster lines. So he has built in raster line functionality into here, and if I hit save, it will enable it right away. 
Now, it's going to be hard to see on the camera, but there are now raster lines visible in the picture to sort of simulate a CRT. Personally, on an LCD screen, I don't like them at all, but it's up to your personal preference if you like them or not. From a compatibility standpoint, I have been running all sorts of games on here and demos, and I haven't found a single thing that doesn't behave exactly as I would expect through this VIC-2 emulation. Randy has done an amazing job at putting a core inside of here that does a great job emulating all the funny idiosyncrasies of the VIC-2 and all those hidden features that modern software uses for the VIC-2. If I run the game Galancia here, and I am running in PAL mode right now, this game takes advantage of drawing inside the border areas in the top and bottom of the display and it works perfectly. There is no glitches whatsoever. So right now this section down here is actually inside what would be the normal border on the VIC-2 chip in PAL mode and no issues whatsoever. It just, it plays perfectly, absolutely perfectly. So I'm putting a question out to my viewers. If anyone has any ideas of what software might exist that historically breaks uh, the implementation of the VIC-2, say on emulators, then please let me know in the comment section below and I can try that out on this so we can see how close to the real thing this actually is. Because so far, like I said, every single thing I've tried on it, nothing has been glitchy from my expectation. It all behaves exactly like I would expect it to. So, so far everything we've been looking at is in HDMI on here. And that's all well and good because of course that gives the most compatibility with monitors that are available these days, even television and stuff like that. But I asked Randy about something else, and it was analog video output. And sure enough, he said, if I took one of these Raspberry Pi VGA hats, which I have, and make a custom cable, which I have done, I can connect this up to here and get analog video output from this thing as well. So if I carefully connect these headers back into here, we should now have analog video output out of this VGA connector. So I'm gonna connect my LCD screen here, the same one we've been using on HDMI, and let's see how this works. All right, here we go, turn it on. And there we go, perfect analog video. And interesting, it's even in the correct aspect ratio. Let's go to the menu and check out the input resolution. It shows it at 720 by 576, 31 kilohertz at 50 hertz. So of course, we are running in PAL mode right now, and this monitor does support PAL over both HDMI and VGA, as you can see right here. So it is working, but it is not PAL regular 15 kilohertz PAL, it is 31 kilohertz PAL, so progressive, so to speak. I'm gonna go into the config program here and switch it from PAL to NTSC, and let's see how my monitor handles this mode. Power cycle the computer. And there we go, we have NTSC working. Of course, this monitor doesn't quite know how to handle the aspect ratio, so it is giving us widescreen again. And that is not something I can even change in here. There isn't a menu option for widescreen or four x three, and that's what was working on PAL, but that only works with resolutions it thinks are television resolutions. And because this is weirdly non-standard at that 58 hertz, it just goes and defaults to widescreen. If uh, he fixes it and it goes to 60 hertz, then I will get a four x three picture over VGA on this monitor. And it goes without saying, now that there's VGA coming out of here instead of HDMI, an analog signal, I can hook up a CRT. And I think everyone knows how much I love looking at things on a CRT. So let's switch from this LCD monitor, which is kind of boring and looks too much like an emulator, to something that's a little more analogous to what you were using with a 64 when it was new. So I need to use this cable here, which I built, and it goes uh, to the back of this multi-sync monitor, which has a 25 pin connector. All right, let's power up the 64. There we go, look at that. I think you'll notice the bar that's scanning relatively quickly on this video signal, faster than would normally be seen on 60 hertz signals. And that's because my camera shutter speed is 1 60th of a second, and this is running at around 58 hertz. So therefore that mismatch between my camera and the monitor is causing that bar to move relatively quickly. Now, this video output is very much like a VGA output, right? It's running at 31 kilohertz, well, thereabouts, right? Which is typical for 640 by 480. So this wouldn't work on a normal monitor like a Commodore 1084. But actually, Randy has added 15 kilohertz support into this thing as well to run at the native resolution of NTSC and PAL monitors. 
Now, people may have noticed there is no option in the config program to make that switch. I think Randy did that on purpose because if you switch it in here and you don't have a monitor that supports 15 kilohertz, you'll get no display. And like my LCD screen here, it doesn't support 15 kilohertz. So it just says out of range and you would be stuck with an FPGA VIC-2 chip that wouldn't do anything for you. Randy moved the ability to make that change to the serial port that is on the side of this thing. It has a, a micro USB port. If I plug a cable into here, my computer will actually show it as a serial port and this while the machine is on and I can make that switch. I switched the mode of operation of the VIC-2 chip into PAL mode, which runs at 50 Hertz. This monitor has no trouble syncing to that since this multi-sync monitor pretty much supports everything. And I switched my camera to 1 50th of a second shutter speed, which is helping to eliminate the bars. I still see in the viewfinder there are some, but it should be less. But we're still running at 31 kilohertz here, so this is still a progressive output. This would not be compatible with a monitor like the 1084, but let me connect up to the serial port and switch this over to 15 kilohertz. So I have Putty open and I'm connected to this thing. Now it's all a little bit cryptic with the way this works. And that's because of course this is a prototype, but he gave me instructions on how to do this. So if I hit control J, I got a question mark, which is telling me that it is responding to me. And if I hit a question mark and control J, then I see R0, C0, K1. R0 is raster lines, they're off. C1 is, I can't remember what C1 and K0 mean. But anyways, those are some of the flags in here. You can hit RE to restore to default. So if I screw this up somehow, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna type 15 and hit control J. I should say, okay, and there we go. When I power cycle this thing, we should be in 15 kilohertz mode now. So I'm gonna power off the machine. And of course the serial port disconnected on my computer. I have to unplug the USB cable. If you power up the machine with it connected, the FPGA won't boot properly, so you're not gonna get anything. So I unplugged it. Here we go, power it on. What are we gonna see? There we go. It is running at 15 kilohertz. Now the positioning, because that's how this monitor works, it's all a little bit out of whack. I gotta adjust the controls here. There we go, that's pretty much centered enough. So it's gonna be hard to see in the camera, but it's definitely running at 15 kilohertz. So there are the good old scan lines. This looks exactly how you would expect it to look running on 15 kilohertz. This thing now looks incredible. I'm gonna run Hero, which is a game I played so much, and there it is. But the difference is to compared to the normal look of a 1084 monitor hooked up to the composite signal or the Luma Chroma is this is pure RGB. So the pixels are so sharp. It looks like we're looking at something like an Apple II GS or an Atari ST or an Amiga but running Commodore 64 software, it's incredible to me. And of course, because it's still using the more vibrant color palette that I've asked Randy to put in there. We can get back to the original PAL color palette though, if I just run palette test here and we hit space bar, and it's gonna change it to this red and I hit Q to quit, quit out of it. It'll reload the more Pepto color palette. So if I exit out and we go back to here, there we go. There's the easy flash menu with the Pepto colors. If you live in a PAL country, tell me if this is how you're used to seeing everything because the colors just look so washed out. It's like the entire color palette has the red turned way down. So like that's kind of a reddish color and it's almost the same as the brown color. And if we reload the hero game here and there it is, it's just so bleh. Like I much prefer the way it looks with the NTSC colors, but please let me know in the comment section what you think about the different color palettes and which you prefer. If you prefer this more muted one, or the actual vibrant one that I prefer myself. So I have to say, I think this project is a really cool and exciting one. I just love seeing the ingenuity of the Commodore 64 and really the retro computer community as a whole. Being able to replace such a complex chip as the VIC-2 with a modern FPGA and have it work in an old bread bin, that's incredible to me. And what's really amazing to me is that how this prototype works basically perfectly. I found a couple little issues that Randy's gonna address, like there's a problem with the analog 15 kilohertz output at NTSC refresh rates, the picture's not positioned properly, but he's gonna fix that. I've also added a feature request for composite sync output when displaying 15 kilohertz, because while this monitor supports horizontal vertical sync and composite sync, a SCART monitor would only support composite sync. So he is gonna work on that as well. So hopefully that adds SCART compatibility in the future. 
Now, let's talk about the future of this project. So one thing Randy's doing, and I have some notes on my phone here, is he wants to add potentially some other functionality to the FPGA inside the VIC-2 here. Besides the 80 column mode that you already saw and those new graphics modes, which may or may not stay, he's also talked about adding some like math coprocessor capabilities to the FPGA in there that would be accessible from the 64 to speed up some operations on the 64. He's also talked about the possibility of larger sprites and also a display address translator like the C65 project is. That was the successor of the 64 that never actually came out, not in retail production at least. He was also telling me about a way the VIC-2 Kawari could actually write to system memory. That's not something that the VIC-2 normally does, but this is connected to the read-write line, so it is possible during idle cycles to write to RAM. So that has some interesting possibilities. Now onto the project itself. He is gonna be working on shrinking the board down and also changing the way that it currently outputs video. So it goes through that pin header to that HDMI transmitter or the analog monitor, I think his intent is to have a DVI connector that has the analog and the digital pins in one connector. So you could use a DVI to VGA passive adapter to hook up an analog display like this, or use a DVI to HDMI cable to hook up a modern monitor. So it kind of would work with everything. As it stands right now, this project does not output any video out of the stock video connector on the 64. So the Chroma Luma, the RF output, none of that does anything. Now, I've been talking to Randy about adding that functionality because that would be pretty desirable because if you want to keep using your 1702 monitor, for instance, with this VIC-2 replacement, you could if it was outputting the video signal like the way the stock chip does. So he's going to be looking into ways to make that possible. No promises, but right now it's nice enough that you can get 15 kilohertz RGB output out of it but composite and S-video output out of this project would be an awesome bonus, even if it was optional. Now, I know one question everyone is asking is when is this gonna be available? Currently, he doesn't have any ideas. This is a project he's working on in his spare time and is very early stages. He has set up a website that has information on the project, so I'll put a link in the description to that. Please take a look at that. I think you can sign up for a mailing list or you can sign up for notification when updates are available, plus, Check out his YouTube channel because he has video updates on there, sort of a blog style thing, where he'll probably be showing future updates of this project. But as it stands now, how much it'll cost, when it will come out, those are all questions that are impossible to answer at this time. One final point I wanna mention is that this project works perfectly in all Commodore 64s, whether it's a long board or a short board, whether it's a PAL or NTSC chip, it can replace them all. You don't need to worry about the crystal oscillator that's on your 64 because like I mentioned, it's not even connected to it at all. It generates all the timing frequencies itself. In fact, it should probably work perfectly, and I haven't tested this, but I don't see why. It should work perfectly on the 64 machines that use the MOS 8501, or is it 8701? Oh, I cannot, it's the little clock chip that fails on some of the 64s. That's not necessary either because that's all part of the timing circuit, which is completely ignored by this particular project. So that is gonna be it for this video. I'm really excited about this project and I can't thank Randy enough for sending me one of these boards for testing. And I just love how well this works, even though it's seemingly so early in the prototype stage. As I mentioned, I couldn't find a single thing that didn't work perfectly on this thing. So how cool is that? We have modern stuff on the horizon for the 64 left and right that just are bringing such cool functionality to it. So thanks Randy for that again. And don't forget to check out his website if you wanna know more information about this project. And if you enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and you know all the other YouTube subscribey stuff. And that is it. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>